Well, good afternoon, and thank you. Those who have uh, stayed through the afternoon and post-lunch are the hearty uh, crowd who uh, really dig into these topics, so we're delighted to be here, and I'm delighted to be here with two terrific public servants who have also, over the years, I've come to enormously respect their, uh, their both experience and their views. They're two people I frequently go to when I'm trying to get my head straight about uh, an issue. So we have Admiral Mike Mullen here, of course, who you uh, uh, knew uh, was um, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, a long and distinguished uh, career, and uh, retired from that post now, what, four years ago? Three and a half. Three and a half years ago. No, yeah. And uh, to my immediate left, Michelle Flournoy, uh, who, of course, runs the Center for New American Security, uh, which I think is one of the most innovative uh, think tanks in, in Washington in uh, many a decade. Uh, Michelle was Under Secretary of Defense uh, for Policy and held uh, previous posts in the uh, Clinton administration as well. You'll find their fuller biographies uh, in your packet, so I won't go in at greater length so that we can get right to the, uh, to the conversation, but thank you both for, for joining us. And well, let me start with you. Um, you famously said about, uh, in, I think around 2009, that the greatest threat to American national security, to your mind, were our deficits. And of course, it was at a time that we were uh, just in the midst of uh, a, a great recession. Uh, there was a lot of question about uh, the degree to which the United States would come back at that time. Uh, we were in spending a huge amount at the Pentagon's in, because we were still in both Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, and our commitment seemed wildly out of line with our projected growth at that time. So if you had been asked the same question in Congress today as you were asked then, would you give the same answer? I think I would. Uh, it was something, uh, it, was, it was, I think it was 2010. It was something that I had actually given a lot of thought to, not just because of the crisis, but the uh, historically, if you go out through the through the uh, defense budget, you can go back to, and I did this once, to 1935 and see a cycle uh, um, uh, over time, and it's about a nine to nine and a half year cycle from top to bottom and then from bottom to top through peace and war, sometimes seemingly not impacted by the fact that we are at war necessarily for a sustained period of time. And in fact, I had been preparing for a crash since as early as 2001, two, and three, expecting this cycle to pick up. I actually originally expected it to happen in the Pentagon on the, in the defense budget uh, on the fives because that seemed to be the dominant historic number. Uh, it didn't happen uh, in 2005, but when it happened in 2008, it really crashed. Uh, and I had engaged economists, I had engaged uh, pundits and analysts to talk about this. So when I was asked this reporter, uh, asked this question by a reporter, quite out of the blue, quite I had no idea. Uh, it was not, uh, it, it wasn't a whimsical reply. It was something I thought very seriously about. And in my world, and I grew up in the budget world uh, inside the Pentagon before I became chairman, uh, it was no more complex at the time that uh, we were, we typically in the Defense Department were about half the discretionary spending in government. The entitlement challenges were continuing to grow and continued to be unaddressed. Uh, and over a period of time, it was going to continue to eat away at what we needed for a national security budget. Uh, I think, and listening to that, I've been here most of the day today, I've, there's nothing that I've heard today that would encourage me to, to say things are a whole lot better. And it was, it was our debt that I was focused on. Uh, it, there's very clearly the deficits have gone down. Yeah. Uh, but the debt continues to rise. It's over $18 trillion. And you were focused on the debt because you thought that each year that would, the required payments on the debt were going to cut into what was available for everything else. The discretionary that. spending the, the available to the government was going was to go down right. because of the mandatory, uh, the, the entitlement mandates, if you will, and that certainly has been the case. Um, it, it also, uh, uh, 
has manifested itself very recently in the, the uh, sequestration, you know, the Budget Control Act, the caps that are associated with that. Uh, and I believe uh, that that will continue. And that's been a very damaging uh, um, uh, act in terms of uh, how they, how it was in fact put in place in every line item uh, in, in the Pentagon and damaged us in terms of uh, overall readiness while it clearly has reduced spending. And in fact, what I've seen happen is I've seen almost the extremes find each other on the other side of the world. Those that don't want to, those on the right that don't want to spend any more and those on the left that don't want to spend any more in defense, they've come to an agreement uh, and, and I think, I, obviously, I'd much rather see decisions made on this side of the earth as opposed to the other side uh, in terms of the moderates. Uh, and and I, so we're very much in the same position that we were, even though our economy's better uh, uh, than it was back then. But overall, uh, uh, debt continues to increase. And in fact, I'm not sure when it's going to happen, but I think, and listening today, just reconfirm this for me that uh, interest rates are going to go up here at some point in time uh, uh, and if not done if not led market forces will drive that and that's going to make the debt challenge that much more significant so Ms. Fournier, if you um, think about uh, what you inherited in 2009 when you came in and you were under secretary for policy through 2012 if I recall right so you had a bit more than three years of going to deal with this and you began dealing with the start of what Admiral Mullen has told us uh, was the damage uh, done by this strange approach of, uh, of cutting everything at, mm -hmm. uh, simultaneously. And I think you've said on many occasions that if you went out to imagine a worse way to go handle the defense budget, it would be hard to come up with one that was um, a worse way to go about it than that. So tell us how you think we got there. If you, if you start by believing that people in Congress fundamentally understand why you wouldn't want to cut everything the same amount, yeah. both programs you need and programs you don't. Well, you know, I, w I would agree with the basic premise, and I think most would, that our national security rests on the foundation of our fiscal and economic health. Um, but I think what's really paralyzed us and has done real damage in the form of sequestration, for example, has been the acute partisanship and the degree of polarization that has caused people to uh, fail to make the sort of pragmatic budget deal that we all know needs to be made. I mean, if, you, if we close the doors in this room and lock them and said, we cannot leave this room until all of us come up with a, a reasonable budget compromise for the United States of America, I assure you, by the time we were hungry for dinner, we would have a sense of, okay, reasonable tax reform, reasonable entitlement reform, reasonable investment in the things that will determine the future of the United States, education, investment, strong uh, ability to support our leadership globally, and so forth. Um, what's been lost is the tried and true tradition of American compromise, pragmatic compromise. I mean, I remember hearing from Secretary Panetta um, when he was budget chairman, he used to talk about his bosses would give him instructions going into budget negotiations. And the two instructions were, A, you're not leaving this room until you have a deal. And you can have as much pizza and beer as you need, but you're not coming out of the room. And B, if you can't get a deal, you don't keep your chairmanship. Now, it's, you know, that dynamic is now lost um, in, our, in one of our branches of government and maybe between two branches of government. And so we are really stuck in a way that is starting to do real harm um, in terms of building the defense we need for the future. Um, but also in terms of our ability to make take strategic discussions, uh, decisions like passing trade promotion authority to get a TPP in place so that we're well positioned to continue to lead in Asia Pacific, which is probably the most important decision that will happen in the next uh, year, year and a half. Well, overlaying the partisan divide that uh, you've described here is the added complication whenever you're doing a defense budget of inheriting old systems wonderfully spread out over everybody's congressional district. Uh, and as a reporter, I always 
knew that when you started hearing members of Congress talk about all the jobs created by a certain defense system, that was usually because they had lost all the arguments about why you still needed that defense system. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, how you would envision future Pentagon budgets if we didn't have to, if we got to do this from the ground up, if we didn't necessarily have to inherit systems that both of you, when you were in your previous jobs, had told Congress we no longer see a utility for, but which continued anyway. Well? Um, there are a lot of thoughts that come to mind when you ask that question. Uh, certainly I'm, uh, and as a programmer, uh, most of my life in the Pentagon, I certainly understand programs worked hard to position themselves in various districts throughout the country so that you had that congressional support. But that was, that was also early as, a, as well as late, and it's the late uh, very late in programs when even we've recognized it's time to go that it becomes very difficult and very expensive to both maintain programs which we need to see go away and yet uh, yet those forces that work very much in our favor early start working against us uh, when we're making those decisions and there's some you know recent very recent uh, one of the programs that's gotten a lot of press recently in that regard was the A-10 program, uh, just as an example. Um, the, for, for those who don't know this here, that's the warthog. That's the war, right. And it's, a, it's an aging, you know, very expensive cost per flight hour airplane uh, that delivers an awful lot of capability. Uh, and there's a big, uh, there's a lot, lot of tension and a big battle right now, both inside the Pentagon and with the Congress. Uh, as to whether or not we should keep that program. But there are, that is an example of, of the challenges that we have. We build them for ourselves. I'm not going to blame Congress. Uh, we're in it with them in that regard, and then sometimes it works against us. The other thing is, though, for systems that we build, which are incredibly expensive and long-term, uh, we've actually, I think, been pretty good in evolving some of those systems from their original intent uh, to uh, what they were needed for, let's just say, in these wars in the last several years. Uh, the cruise missile program is one example. Uh, uh, certainly, uh, from the Navy's perspective, systems we built for the Cold War evolved to, to what, in many ways, what we needed to, uh, to handle ourselves in these wars. But the other thing, if we're gonna, if we're gonna get at the money in the Pentagon, one of the real things that I, at least I don't, I don't see it talked about much, is our people are, first of all, they're, they've been spectacular. They're the best I've ever served with. But they're also the most expensive uh, that they've, they've ever been. And so while we talk about uh, system A, B, or C uh, as, the, as the principal way to sort of get at our budget problems, it's when I was the chief of the Navy, uh, my budget was 60 to 70 percent people. Uh, that, it's what it cost me. That's active, reserve, retired, medical, etc. Uh, the Marine Corps and the Army are actually a little bit more expensive than that because they're more people intense. So if we're going to get at, uh, if we're going to reduce the size of the Pentagon budget, uh, you have to go where the money is, and that's why the discussion right now uh, centers uh, in many ways on re reducing the size of the, the uh, in particular, the Army and the Marine Corps. Uh, the Navy and the Air Force have actually come down in recent years, but that's where the money is. Often, I'm, I'm not saying we shouldn't do away with systems that are obsolete, but I don't think we're going to solve the problems there. We, we have to come to grips with what's the quality, what's the, what will we what will we invest in, in terms of our people, to make sure we're okay? And if we get that right, and we keep the right people uh, in the military uh, in this, in this uh, after what we've been through, I think we're gonna be okay. But that is the essence of the issue in terms of both quality uh, matching up to the, to, the, uh, to the requirements that are out there, uh, and, uh, and an ability to really perform the mission exceptionally well. Well, Ms. Florent, if you, if you take Admiral Mullen's um, view that we need the Willie Sutton rule here, you rob banks because that's where the money is, mm -hmm. you've got to go focus on people because that's where the money is, and then think about our long-term commitments. Uh, Secretary Gates, who you worked with 
for so long, was on TV this morning, and uh, he uh, said, I think um, the whole Middle East is likely to be an area of turbulence and violence for as far into the future as we can see. Sunnis versus Shia, authoritarians versus reformers, seculars versus uh, Islamists. And that that then raises the question, how long and at what level are we going to feel required, if this is a generational problem, to keep a very big human force available for that at a time that you're trying to do the pivot to Asia, which you were deeply involved in, in, in trying to get started? Well, I think that the, the best approach here is to take a two-pronged approach, one which really goes after the reform agenda much more aggressively than we have in the past. And this is not about taking benefits away from the people who've served and sacrificed. This is about reconceiving systems to get better outcomes at lower cost. If you look at health care, DOD delivers health care in the most expensive possible way. It's a system that was designed decades ago, not informed by today's best practices, and people complain about it. They're not very happy with the outcomes they get. So overhauling the health care uh, system to reflect better outcomes at potentially lower cost, that's the way to go as an example on reform. At the same time, what you're pointing to is we need a much more strategic pr approach, a strategy-driven approach to what we're investing in in terms of readiness today and capabilities for tomorrow. I do, th I do agree that the Middle East is going to be an area of turmoil where we do have interests that we're going to have to um, stay engaged in in some way in the future. But in my mind, it is you know, dealing with the very specific threats of counterterrorism and counterproliferation as we also try to put in place um, ability to deter uh, larger scale aggression, reassure allies, and so forth. Um, I do think that that's consistent with the sense that over the longer term, we want to put more focus and attention on really sustaining and adapting the, the rules-based order in Asia Pacific. Asia Pacific is going to, more than any other region, drive US prosperity and security in the long term. And we, have, we were the architects of the order there that really allowed for the stability of, for tremendous economic development of many countries, including China and India and so many others over the last decades. Um, with a rising China that is calling into question or challenging some of those rules of the road, we've got to stay present, we've got to keep our leadership role there, we've got to keep maintaining our alliances and our partnerships uh, to try to work with China and, and integrate them into the system and where we must um, protect the, the rules as we, under, you know, as we see them, um, as, we, as we believe they're important. Well, a hallmark of President Obama's approach to this has been, um, I think, twofold. One, a light footprint, trying to use technologies that cost us far less. Drones are an example. Cyber is an example. Cases where you have a, a remotely, a, a remote weapon where you don't have to worry as much about American casualties. And I think a second part has been trying to get allies to pay up their share, get involved more, think of the arguments over Libya uh, about whether or not the Arab League would come in, whether or not others would come in who had as much of a stake in it. It strikes me he's been more successful in pushing the new technologies, which have been adopted uh, very heavily, than he has been in convincing the allies. The Europeans are still spending less than they've committed to, for example, on, on defense. So talk a little bit about the interplay of those two, either, either one of you. I was uh, actually delighted with the way Libya started from the standpoint of once the decision was made, we were going in to have the Europeans lead it. Now, I, I know the president was criticized for that, but quite frankly, this was their backyard. They were very interested in that. Uh, they could not have done it without us. We knew that. Uh, and, uh, and I thought that was a, a good model and example at the time, even though as the operation continued to unfold, they, the Europeans started to come up against some, I'll call them logistic stops, if you will, where they were going to start running out of munitions and capability. And, and that's what happened. Against an enemy who wasn't really shooting back. No. Which made that, you a, a little more worried about it. Yeah. But, but uh, that, that's also uh, 
there, there was huge political capital which was put in place early to lead all that effort, not just here in our country, but in those countries as well. Uh, and I think that's absolutely critical for how we're going to proceed in the future. But when you have those, most of those countries were NATO countries, and when you have them spending what they're spending, which is in, in I think, in, inside NATO now, with the exception of two countries, less than 2%, there's not much capability there. I mean, you look at the UK right now, uh, and I think the UK has 22 ships or 30, or 30 ships, something like that. that that's, they're a very important political ally, but in terms of delivering capability, it's something you worry about. And in that, on that continent, before I even get to the Middle East, when you look at what's happened recently in, in the last 24 months with Russia and how Putin has actually pushed the limits, uh, been egregious in violating international law, uh, and, and we've got allies over there who are now asking questions, are we going to be there for him, for them, particularly the Baltics and those countries that came into NATO late, they, you know, I think they have legitimate questions that, that, uh, that they're asking and concerns about how this is going to play out from a capability standpoint. Extending that further into the Middle East, um, and the Middle East isn't going to go away. I, I, you know, I wasn't a big fan of that. I, I wasn't a big fan of the word pivot, because I mean, literally, as soon as that word was used, the, my friends in Europe and my friends in the Middle East were going, "Well, well what does that mean? You know, are we are we chopped liver? We can do as Bob Gates." They did said, come out and tell us it was actually rebalancing, wasn't that? Yeah. Not right. <laughs> but, but, the. And Bob Gates said it this morning. He said, you know, we can walk and chew gum. We're, we can, historically we have, we've got the resources to do it. We need to be able to continue to lead and to handle several things sustained with a strategy over a period of time, including Asia Pacific. I think the, the 21st century is the century of Asia Pacific. For no other reason, you've got three of the biggest economies in the world which are going to drive out there, and that's going to greatly influence the world. So we need to be able to do both. And I don't see, I worry a great deal in, in, in talking to friends of ours, that w they worry about whether we're not going to be there. So I worry that we will continue to disengage. How light is light? And how comfortable is remote? Uh, I'm a Navy guy. I, you know, I've grown up out there my whole life. I think the engagement piece, the presence piece, the being there piece makes a huge, huge difference. And we need to resource ourselves so that, uh, so that we can continue to do that, particularly after war. I understand that. We have a tendency to isolate after war. I understand that. But this isn't 1947 or 75 or 92. The world's up in, a pre in pretty tough shape right now. We have to be very, very diligent about what we're going to say we're going to do, what we're going to do, how we're going to resource it, and what we're not going to do. Well, Michelle, if you think about the pivot as, or the rebalancing as you envisioned it, in its broadest sense, not just the military side, but TPP, which you mm -hmm. mentioned, and so forth. How would you score about where we are in the progress line compared to where you had planned or hoped we would be by the last 18 months of the mm -hmm. Obama presidency? Well, the rebalance was really in response to a question that President Obama asked very early on, which is, as we come out of a decade where we've been focused on ground wars in the Middle East, and presumably we will free up both leader bandwidth and resources. Where do we place that? Where do we put our, where are the strategic opportunities for the future? And that's where the idea of the rebalance um, to put more in relative terms, more bandwidth, more resources towards Asia, Asia Pacific came from. So I think it's always been about taking a series of incremental steps, first dipl diplomatically signaling the renewed importance of the region showing up building those relationships, investing, and I think, you know, Secretary Clinton lived on a plane going to Asia, as did people like Kurt Campbell, to do that. Um, then there were a series of incremental military steps, beefing up our presence, working with partners to build their capacity, security cooperation, and so forth. Um, and I think those will continue. The next big step is TPP, to say that we are going to be part of the defining the rules of the road for trade in this region for the next generation. And, um, and I think we could do everything else right on the rebalance, and if we fail on TPP, we will get a very low grade. 
Um, and if we get TPP and don't do much else right, we'll still get a good grade. You know? So I think in this phase of the rebalance, getting that trade agreement set is the most important thing we can do for the next couple of years on this issue. And on the fiscal side, let's, let's take for a moment uh, Ms. Forno's point about TPP. On the fiscal side, what, what is the one thing, I know we're running out of, out of time here, but what's the one biggest thing that you think we could get Congress to do and the President to agree on that would make a significant difference in the way the world views the future of American power? That question was asked earlier uh, today, and I thought uh, uh, Chairman Price's answer was was significant to you know get a budget so people can actually uh, for us for the the Pentagon right now so we can get out of sequestration and plan uh, and have some. Well, we're you actually, set a pretty low bar. In the well, old days, no, a budget would have been assumed. I, know, I understand <laughs> that, and and, and and yet, I mean, we have I think degraded to the point where certainly in the near term. That's uh, hugely critical so that we can actually plan more than 12 months at a time. Okay. I think that the, there's an opportunity to have a larger national discussion about the risks that we're accumulating and that we're taking by not solving the problem we know we need to solve. And I actually think that it's a really important moment for think tanks like Peterson, like CNAS, to develop some of the intellectual capital that says, you know, if we were all to come to our senses again <laughs> and embrace some form of pragmatic compromise, what does that really look like? And how do we make that politically viable for people? How do we build support for people embracing pragmatic compromise as opposed to threatening them with failing to be reelected if they compromise? Um, so we have a long way to go, but I do think that outside voices in this moment are even more important to try to define the path forward and how you get to some of those reasonable compromises in the future. I was, I was struck earlier, uh, I guess it was at the lunch panel with the chiefs of staff, and, uh, and I think Bill Daly said, and, and Andy Card and uh, Josh Bolton agreed, that in order for this issue, this issue, that debt issue and the fiscal crisis that we're in, to get any legs, uh, it's got to be camped, it's got to be part of the campaign. And now's the time, as you know, this town is now directed at all the candidates. How do I get my issues into their queue so that uh, I can make contact with somebody that somebody is going to be the next president of the United States? I think that's really important and that it does become a campaign issue after which to connect with the American people and after which it then can uh, generate a strategy and a plan to be dealt with. Well, we're not out of questions, but we are out of time to allow you guys to get to your last session. I want to thank both of you Thanks. for this conversation. Really appreciate it. And thank, thank all you. of you for Thanks. participating. Thanks.